This is the inside of a computer. And these are some of the people who work with it. What has all this got to do with the business of winning coal? Plenty. Because computers are playing an increasing part in keeping our coal industry in the forefront of industrial efficiency. Take a man's wages. The payout at the end of a hard week's work. All over the country, men collect a wage packet. And inside it, with the money, is a pay slip. The slip carries written information, tax deductions, allowances, and so forth. The same basic details have already been punched onto a card in a pattern of holes. And the information on the cards can be fed through machines to make an instantaneous record on magnetic tape to become part of the memory stored up inside a computer system. All a computer is, really, is a lightning calculator which can refer to what it has been told and print out the answer to the complicated mathematical problem it has been set. Which brings us back to Bill Smith's payslip. In an industry the size of coal, the uses of computers are enormous. Information of all kinds can be recorded and stored and filed away for when it's needed. It's goodbye to the old days of bulging manila folders in dusty storerooms. A neat row of plastic tapes holds the equivalent of a warehouse. Wage calculations are just one very simple example. The real use of computers in an industry of half a million people lies in helping to make decisions, to produce the facts on which policy is based, in production, in assessing demand, in marketing, to keep an efficient industry that one jump ahead. In this household, the washing up must wait, because high on the list of life's pleasures is a hot bath with a cake of soap. And speaking of soap, Bestwood Colliery in Nottingham has a very good customer right on its doorstep. 7,000 tons of coal a year are delivered to this soap works. It's a case of black making white. Coal from the rich Nottinghamshire seams, coal to raise steam to make soap. This machinery is the most advanced of its type in the world, cutting the time for preparing the ingredients of soap from nearly four days to 12 minutes. Tallow, the soap maker's name for the animal fats, and palm kernel oil are mixed together. Add caustic soda, and the result is soap. With glycerine as a valuable byproduct. That's the basic formula. But even with the latest machinery, the recipe is essentially the same. After drying, the soap is fed into a noodler, a sort of large mincing machine. Color is added, and then the important touch which makes soap smell nice, perfume. More mixing, and the soap appears as a long bar, and is cut into tablet size. This stamping machine produces 240 rectangular pieces of soap every minute. Eagle eyes make sure that only perfect tablets pass inspection. Some brands are wrapped in foil or paper, and after packing, they're on their way to the domestic market. After a hard day's housework, there's nothing more relaxing than a bath, with plenty of soap to wash away tiredness. and some of it goes back to Bestwood Colliery, almost next door. Soap for the men who got the coal that raised the steam to make the soap. On January the 29th, 1965, the Medal of the Institution of Mining Engineers was awarded to James Anderton. The medal which is held by only three other mining engineers now living. The story begins in 1952, when the first Anderton shearer loader, a coal cutting machine, started work in the St. Helens area of Lancashire. For some time, with the help of his engineers, James Anderton, then area general manager of 15 collieries, 
had been working on the idea of turning an ordinary coal cutter into a machine which would both cut and load the coal. The breakthrough came when he decided to take off the cutter's jib, the part which cuts the coal, and fit instead a horizontal shaft. On this shaft he mounted a drum, and around the drum, keen-edged picks to shear out a strip of coal 19 inches wide along the coal face. Behind it, the machine hauled a plow to sweep the coal onto the conveyor during the machine's cutting run along the coal face. And when the machine returned to start another cut, more coal was pushed onto the conveyor. Early in 1954, a St. Helens newspaper reported this revolution in mining technique. The Anderton shearer loader swept into the coal faces of Britain, till in 1957 there were more than 220 of them cutting and loading a fifth of all Britain's coal. But that same year, 1957, came a check. For the first time since the war, Britain's coal production outstripped demand, and above all, there was too much small coal which was precisely the size of coal the Anderton Shearer loader produced most efficiently. Production and mechanization men met to talk over the next move. To get more large coal, it seemed that they must scrap all they had achieved and start again. So it was back to the drawing board. Throughout the next year at Collier's and in the new central engineering establishment at Bretby, Mining engineers worked out ways to make the shearer loader get more large coal. They took off the drum and substituted a cutter shaped like a frame. They upended the original horizontal drum. They put a boring tool in place of the drum and called it a trepanner. This last attempt was a solid success. Now the engineers were sure that they could modify the original shearer loader to do almost anything they asked of it. Today, there are a bewildering number of modifications of that first simple breakthrough. Two drums on one machine, cutting on two levels, and backwards as well as forwards, can take care of thick seams of coal. The Anderton shearer has survived triumphantly, today getting large coal as well as small. Naturally, it was to become the first machine to cut and load coal by remote control, without a man on the coal face. The demand for energy is always increasing. By 1970, we should be supplying 100 million tons of coal for electricity, and the power stations like small coal. The shearer loader has come to stay. Today, 630 are at work in Britain. 440 have been sold overseas. This rare medal is a tribute, not only to James Anderton himself, but to all the others who helped him to develop his idea to become an international success. By the light of knowledge, thou shalt conquer.